Miranda? Muted, sir. Here. Here. Manny Stackle. Here. Okay. Ms. Corbett, if you'd like to begin your PowerPoint. Sure. Again, for the record, Cami Corbett, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700 here representing the applicant owner. Uh, my presentation this evening is going to focus on the, uh, the two aspects that uh, Susan outlined for you, which is uh, you are being asked to approve the recommendation of the, the special magistrate and a revised PD plan uh, this evening. The proposed settlement site plan enhances the compatibility and consistency of the proposed development. The Planning Commission has found that the revised site plan is consistent and land development coordination finds that the revised site plan is consistent. As was outlined by staff, the things that the applicant offered to enhance compatibility within the development was a reduction in density. As Judge Case pointed out, we reduced density three different times throughout the process and we are at 205 units we eliminated 35 units we reduced building heights from three four story and three story to three story and two story the maximum building heights for these buildings is 45 feet and 35 feet respectively we increased the buffering along the eastern boundary we increased screening with fencing and landscaping along the eastern boundary and then we're still doing the things that we were doing during the original proposal, which is we have sites and buildings designed for compatibility within the community. We're providing green space with the pavilion seating area that's accessible from Trash Street to the public. And again, we are asking for no waivers and we're fully consistent with the land development code. Just to reorient you to the site plan that we showed and the revisions this shows the six foot landscaping buffer. The items that are underlined are the new items. Um, along the eastern brown boundary line, we had a fence and landscaping along the southern boundary line in the original plan, and we've added that element to the eastern boundary. We are proposing a 5,500 square foot clubhouse and an amenity facility, as well as a dog park internal to the site, and then that public open space. Uh, down here and we are providing uh, sidewalks. We are also preserving all of the non-hazardous grand trees that are on the site. As Mary showed you, these are our two-story building elevations. You'll see that the architectural style is coastal and more consistent with single family than some of the other types of multifamily that you see on the other side of West Shore. This is a height plane analysis. This is in the northeast corner by building four. You'll see that we've measured the site distance between uh, the proposed building footprint and the existing residential, and you'll see that that nearest distance is 55 feet. The maximum height is 35 feet, which is the same as what is allowed in single family. Moving on to our three-story buildings, we're still maintaining that architecture, uh, that it has a much more residential, single family residential feel than multifamily. And here's the height plane analysis for the third story building, three story building that uh, faces Wall Street. The distance between a building and the nearest home on Wall Street is 172.6 feet. And the maximum height is 45 feet versus 35 feet for single family. When it comes to the coastal management elements, we have offered to construct two bus shelters along the existing heart evacuation route. That's not something that would be required, but we thought that it would do two things, not only just uh, address coastal management uh, by encouraging people to utilize HARP for evacuation, but probably more importantly, it generally encourages the use of transit for everyone. By providing these bus shelters, we encourage folks to ride the bus and utilize our public transit system, which is so needed in our community. Uh, we are still providing the site-specific hurricane evacuation preparedness plan, and I'll discuss that in a little more detail in the following slide. Uh, the developer will be still required to make the mitigation payment for shelter space per the land development code. And then, of course, we'll be building to the current building codes that require us to be above base flood elevation and to Category 4 hurricane wind building code standards. Just for your reference, this is the, this is the location of the proposed bus shelters. This is at McCoy in Manhattan. 
And then again, with our voluntary site-specific hurricane evacuation and preparedness plan, we will have an educational element, but the most important part is it requires a developer to uh, evac provide evacuation transport services to residents at its own solve cost and expense. As stated earlier, the revised site plan enhances compatibility features of the plan. We've added additional conditions to impose uh, to impose to address coastal planning area concerns, no waivers, finding of consistency from all agencies and planning commission finds it consistent. We do think that in addition to uh, the consistency and compatibility of the proposed plan, there are some positive outcomes resulting from approval of settlement. One, you have an approved plan before you with lower density, less intensity, improved buffering and screening. We eliminate high intensity industrial use adjacent to single family re residential. They re we reduce the allowable trips on the road network from th th 3,400 approximately to approximately oops, 1,100. Uh, we have local job creation. We have a 25 million construction budget with a local GC who sources subs locally. We create hundreds of construction jobs for the local labor force for 16 to 17 months. There will be an exponential increase in the city tax base to fund future priorities. And finally, of course, it resolves lawsuits and avoids costly time, time consuming litigation. And with that, I would ask you to respectfully request that you approve the settlement and the proposed site plan. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I hear none. Okay. Uh, anybody else on, on your side, Ms. Corbett, that wishes to present or speak? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, hearing that, uh, do we have public comment for this item, Madam Clerk? Yes, we have five people that are logged on. Um, okay. We got a total of seven that's registered. I don't know if you want to check with the convention center first. Okay. Do we have anybody at the convention center that wishes to speak on this item? Item number 11, REZ 19-94. This is Eileen Glossario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, having that information, Madam Clerk, if you'd like to begin with the five speakers, we'll swear them in and I will keep uh, time, um, three minutes per speaker. Yes, sir. I'm moving them over now. Thank you. Can you do all five or do you have to do four at a time? I have all five. So okay. that's... Carol Ann Bennett, Jean Strohmeyer, Steve Meadows, Stephanie Pointer, and Mary Kate Jones. Okay, once I see them on screen, we'll swear them in. All right. If our speakers are coming on, remember to turn on your camera. Okay, I see two people. Three. Four. Right, and we're missing one more speaker. Yes, Mr. Steve Meadows, you need to unmute yourself and turn on your video. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. It said I was Hello. unmuted. <laughs> well, we can't see Mr. Uh, Meadows is the, the one camera that we can't see. Stephanie, we're twinsies. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you, but can I can't see you. have to turn your camera on. Mr. Meadows, there's a video icon you need to click on to turn on your camera. Well, he can hear us. Um, can okay. I ask uh, why? We have to be on video because that's how these uh, quasi-judicial hearings are. You have to, since we can't be face-to-face, -face, we have to be at least uh, see the person who's speaking. And, well, I, I see 
I see me with all of the pictures of you guys. So are you? Am I up now? I can't no, see you though. No, I can't see you. Oh well, maybe if I go share my webcam. Okay. There we go. That, there we go. Cool. <laughs> all right, we're going to swear you in. So please, all of you, raise your uh, right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, yes you help me, God. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. I will begin in the order that I see on my screen. I have uh, Mary Catherine Jones. If you'd like to speak, you have three minutes, and I will start the timer. All right. Good evening, Councilman. I first want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in opposition of the Trask rezoning. And I please apologize. Say your name. Oh, my name is Mary Catherine Jones. Sorry. I apologize that I was not present for the initial meeting as I was in the middle of a high risk pregnancy. As a direct neighbor to the Trask property, I am obviously coming to you with multiple concerns. We purchased our home six years ago, one for the larger piece of property and cute house, but two for the large field and lack of development on the back road on the Trask property. The last thing we expected was the possibility of 205 of our closest new friendly neighbors in our backyard. With two small children, we spend plenty of time outside, and the last thing we want is not only construction noise from three-story apartments, but the ongoing noise that apartments will bring. Our neighborhood continues to welcome more and more families. I had previously heard that the developers were trying to appeal to our local military, but are apartments really what they are looking for? I asked two local South Tampa groups the same question. If you are military, do you currently live in a house or do you live in an apartment? Of the 44 people that responded, 41 people currently live in a single family house. Two responded that they live in a townhome and one person currently lives in an apartment. Although a small sample size, these numbers speak for themselves. It was brought up that it was brought up that currently um, E4 and below single airmen are looking for apartments. Fortunately, there are five apartment complexes currently open, one more in construction, and as you know, Councilman, one more was approved last month off of Interbay. All of these are within one mile of the Trask property. After inquiring, all five of the currently operating apartments have vacancies. So then why would we need yet another apartment complex when we are not filling the ones we ha already have? Fort Tampa is attracting families, both young and old, both military and civilian, who are looking for single family home houses and safe, quiet neighborhoods, not apartments. Which brings me to my next point. My family of four walks or bikes their neighborhood often. We see many others out running, walking, and biking. There have been many times we have had to swerve or walk in the street because of overgrown sidewalks, specifically on McCoy. This would obviously not be an option when 400 plus proposed new cars are frequenting McCoy daily. Not only is McCoy already busy enough, but all of our south of Gandy roads are at capacity, if not past capacity. Our infrastructure does not support the continuation of the rapid growth in apartments, whether during a routine normal day or especially during any kind of evacuation. What happens when we have another Irma? And while we're here, let's talk about South Tampa's notorious flooding. This property is partially located in an AE flood zone. Although we border this property, we are not currently in a flood zone. I'm aware that this plan has flood mitigation, but so did the other large apartments in our area. And many of the older homes in our Port Tampa neighborhoods are now flooding. These home are homes that did not flood in the past. With two small children, will my family now have to worry about flooding when we've never had an issue? We can have all the written evidence in the world that the plan for drainage will suffice, as I'm sure the surrounding apartment complex has had, but time is telling a different story on the surrounding homes. Also, will this change our flood zone designation in the future, creating another cost for our family and the surrounding families? In the February meeting, it was stated that the city of Tampa encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future population. My point is that the expansion can co should coincide with the surrounding neighborhoods and the neighbors who directly border this property. And we are in single homes. Again, thank Councilman, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please, will be uh, Jean Strohmeyer. You have three minutes. Please state your name before you speak. Wait, before I speak, just because, I mean, this is our seventh out of seven that we are last seven out of seven and we're here for five hours listening to everybody else this is the seventh time five hours plus the mediation just so you guys know i don't know why we are doomed to be last on this agenda every time but it is seven out of seven five hours every time plus the extra mediation 
and the extra time that we spend preparing. And, and you know, luckily, when we the Zoom is a good thing because I was able to literally cook dinner. I had a dinner party. I did my dishes and sat here and watched all of this and, and then some. So the part about the Zoom is good, but I just don't know why we're always put last on the agenda every hey, time. Hey, hey, Jane, hey, Jean, we haven't even had dinner yet. We've been at it since five. So uh, I so well, we, we come in at five because we don't know what's going to happen. So right, but, and I'm right. sorry, we haven't had dinner. Go but, ahead, and then, then just another thing, Mr. Dingfelder, I, I, I just heard about your dad. You mentioned that and I want to just give, you know, just just mention that. And I'm sorry for your loss of that. And, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. I, that's, I can't imagine I'm not there yet, but I'm getting close. So I just wanted to say that. So here we All right. go. Go ahead. Please state your name. Okay. I am Jean Strohmeyer, and I am here to speak in opposition to this project. Yes, I know it's already agreed to, but we still have something to say about it. Um, the overbuilding in south of Gandhi is just out of control. Um, so we oppose this project. <clears throat> Ooh, the, the plan is inconsistent with the Tampa comprehensive plan. As we have said, I had brought up originally the military base and the over, over building around by the base here. It includes all of South Tampa. Um, you know, if we keep, um, furthering the density, um, then they can up and leave, which we don't want. It's just would be pretty bad. The property, as we know it, is in a coastal high hazard area. We were told, you know, that that's not a good thing, that it shouldn't be, and um, that we disagree with that. Uh, they said that they brought it to standard, I guess, if they say they did, but I'm just not sure about that. So, but we just disagree for that reason. Um, also, the the they the the property is not consistent with the um, Tampa Comprehensive Plan because uh, South Tampa, especially here, is an established in an area of stability. No significant changes in development patterns should be taking place here. Um, the plan, uh, it did not, uh, it's just not built within the current zoning district, the, the way the way it's zoning that we believe. Um, we would like to encourage uh, more mixed use of the properties to keep our neighborhood stabilized and have a little more um, diversity here as far as you know ownership, home ownership is what is good for people. Um, you know, again, the coastal high hazard is a is also a bad thing. Um, so, and also the you know just to change the property from industrial to um, to the plan development there you know do they just put that out there um just so they can build apartments you know to us it's just another apartment complex and you know this is a single family home area we're in a peninsula if we need to get out uh, we're gonna have a problem getting out of here with all the density uh we've got saint pete coming through here when they need to evacuate so and we have everybody that lives on base so you know basically we're sitting ducks and when the time comes because it will come then you know all the people that are stuck in their cars trying to get out are doomed and you know everybody has to answer for that i've done my diligence and so have the rest of these good people have done what we could to stop this but it's gone on deaf ears for the city from the city of tampa thanks for trying for those that have i appreciate that thank yeah. you very much all right, next speaker will be Carol Ann Bennett. You're muted, if you could unmute yourself. You can hear me now. Yes. Um, before we start my time, um, I would like to um, have the ability to share my screen. Um, plus, um, if I could get an extra minute or two, just so that you know, I don't have problems sharing my screen. Is there any objection from any of the council members to give uh, Ms. Bennett another minute? Any objection? Yes. So move if need be. I have no problem. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I'm a lifelong resident of South Tampa. Um, all of South Tampa is in the coastal planning area, the CPA. 
This property is not only in the CPA, it is in the coastal high hazard area, the CHH. It is also in evacuation zone A. Uh, okay. This, provo this proposed rezoning violates and conflicts with the comprehensive plan. The vision map says where growth and higher density should occur and where neighborhoods should remain unchanged and stable. There are six levels of growth intensity. South Tampa is level one, no significant change. You will see South Tampa is in none of the desired growth circles. The comp plan says to direct population away from the CHH and achieve a no net increase in residential density. This rezoning violates the comp plan. The comp plan says to maintain and reduce hurricane clearance times. I want you to imagine 421 cars in front of you at an intersection. Now tell me with a straight face that this will not reduce your evacuation time. And don't kid yourselves and don't try to kid me. These people will pack their cars and drive out. They are not going to take a bus. Those bus shelters are not going to make any difference whatsoever. The comp plan repeatedly addresses evacuation times. It says to ensure the safe passage of evacuees, provide a transportation system for safe evacuation, to coordinate hurricane evacuation, and to place a priority on maintaining the capacity of, evacu of evacuation routes. Planning in the CPA should restrict development, ensure that evacuation times do not deteriorate, and that safe and timely evacuation is not adversely impacted. Public expenditures should not encourage growth in CHAs, and coastal hazards should be considered in each land use decision. The plan says to ensure new development minimizes minimize risk from hurricanes, ensure that the population can be safely evacuated and, in, and density increases outside of desired areas should be discouraged. If increases in density should be minimal. There should be little or no increase in evacuation times and there should be no net gain in population in CHH. A coastal manage, management goal is to protect human life. We don't wanna die sitting in our cars, weathering out a hurricane in our cars. As a result of the 04 and 05 hurricane seasons, the state legislature passed Bill 7121, which requires growth management to be tied to the updated evacuation studies. Their intent is perfectly clear. Florida law legally requires you to consider the impact of growth on evacuation. No one can show me this evaluation is being done, because believe me, I've asked. No one can tell me how long it will take to evacuate this peninsula because believe me, I've asked. The comp plan requires careful consideration of adverse impacts to surrounding neighborhoods. Development shall be minimally disruptive. The city shall assess the negative impacts of developments on the pattern and character of the surrounding area. This neighborhood is single family residential. The, the city should protect low density single family areas, maintain the character of single family residential areas, including density characteristics, maintain the current density and character of existing single fam family areas, and protect areas of the lowest intensity of development, which is this. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not quite, give me, come on, I'm waiting five hours. CM policy 1.2.3 requires an annual review of new development. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Chairman. Council did say four minutes. If, if, she, if council wants to give additional time, then council can take that up. I should also point out that Ms. Corbett has the opportunity on the council's rules, and I can recite them for additional time for rebuttal as a result of, for due process considerations. That's so I fine. ask council to go. Any objection for another minute? Remember that to the applicant, we will, if uh, we should extend the same courtesy to them, uh, should they request it. Any One more minute, Mr. Chairman. One more minute. All right, go ahead. 
Thank you. CM policy 1.2.3 requires an annual review of new development in the CPA to monitor impact on evacuation times. This needs to be done. I am officially requesting the city council to order this review as the comp plan mandates. Last screen. It has never been law that a landowner is entitled to highest and best use of their land. A zoning classification is presumptively valid. The buyer knew the zoning before they bought the property. There are 60 plus uses they are entitled to. They are not entitled to further entitlements. Rezoning of this property was denied in 2018 by the previous city council and it should be denied again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Stephanie Pointer. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm going to make it short and sweet. Um, first strike, second strike, and now here we are. This is the third time. That Please say your name for the Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. This is um, my name is Stephanie Pointer. I am a licensed realtor and property manager. Um, I actually own a house on the corner of McCoy and Lanier, less than 1,000 feet away from this property. Um, and McCoy is a residential street, not a main thoroughfare. Um, there are speed humps on that street. So, um, and, and I actually probably prompted the warning from Mr. Shelby earlier today because I told everybody to call in. So um, that kind of was misconstrued on the website and I apologize for that. But everyone who called you was at least in their 80s because they called me on the phone because they did not have a computer and they do not go out at night. Um, so I'd like to say that for the record. Um, but we're here tonight for the third time the second city council has heard this property. Um, Mr. Keating bought this property knowing that it had been turned down for rezoning. Mr. Keating um, knew that people were going to tell him no because he was told no before he brought it before the city council. When he purchased this, the property, he bragged all over the internet that he was going to put other businesses in there. But hmm, all of a sudden we need apartments. But no big deal. Um, the comp plan, we keep going back to that. Page four of the comp plan says that um, South Tampa is a level one area with no significant changes. It's an established area that should not be, um, it's predominantly traditional single family, single family detached neighborhoods that share more, one or more of the following characteristics. I can read those to you, but we all know what the comp plan looks like. Um, let's see. All the houses to the east of that property are single story homes, except one. Why do I know this? Because I've walked all those neighborhoods. Um, to the south, also all single story homes built in the 60s. So these people are gonna look out their windows and look into these folks like Mary Kate's backyard. Um, I'd also like to put in place that there are, we are already at 78,000, we are already, I'm sorry, at 85,000 people. And the comp plant called for, for us to be at 200 or by 2040 to be at 78. So we're well over our numbers for then. And oh, by the way, don't forget that McDill has approximately 23,000 people who work at it and 527 units on base. That's from McDill's impact statement, or its economic impact statement. So not only are we over by 10,000 people, but we have an additional 23,000 people who move through our corridor daily, but it's okay. Just thank you very much. Apartments. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Next up is Mr. Steve Meadows. Hi, my name is Steve Meadows. Uh, I live at 7512 Southwest Shore Boulevard. I'm the treasurer of the Civic Association of Port Tampa. Uh, I'm here to oppose the uh, rezoning of this property. Uh, you should know the reason for the red shirt. Uh, I think we've been wearing them through the, you know, the whole term of your stuff or all these rezoning hearings. Uh, some of this is going to be somewhat redundant. Uh, you know, we've talked about the coastal high hazard area, the fact that this property uh, is in the coastal high hazard area and uh, the idea behind that under objective 1.1 is the direct future population concentrations 
away from the coastal high hazard area so as to achieve no net increase in overall residential density. Uh, there's also some stuff about hurricane evacuation, which brings up the fact that Dale Mabry is the designated route, uh, but Dale Mabry is probably not going to hold the traffic uh, or carry the traffic uh, particularly well when everybody tries to get out because Manhattan floods, before you get to Gandhi, Manhattan floods again at, at uh, El Prado, MacDill floods at El Prado and, uh, 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 and MacDill. Uh, Bayshore floods, so you basically cut off 90% of the, the north-south uh, evacuation routes and the fact that St. Petersburg brings their traffic through South Tampa, and if you've ever come across Gandy Bridge going eastbound uh, after 3, 3 p.m., you're basically looking at a 45-minute run across Gandy Bridge. So you're not going to get across that way very easy, uh, at least unless you leave three days in advance of the hurricane. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, I, I noticed that, you know, somebody mentioned that there was a green space a across the, the north end. If this thing does pass, you, you may want to give up the, uh, the, the two bus stops that nobody will use and actually put some of that money to use to, to you know, to start the green space on the north side of the property. Uh, that will probably actually do something and, and also help the city, you know, finish the other portion of it that runs over to Manhattan. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. I appreciate you allowing me the time to speak. Um, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you very much. And that concludes our public comment because again, there was nobody at the Tampa Convention Center to speak live. Uh, having said that, um, do we have any questions or comments by city council members before we go to rebuttal by the petitioner? Council member Goods. Chairman, thank you for your leadership tonight. I know it's a long night. Ms. Johnson Felez. Uh, yes, sir. We've had several folks that have spoke, spoken tonight. Mm -hmm. Were they a part of the mediation or? Ms. Ms. Bennett and Ms. Pointer were, were the two participants from the public in the mediation and they did attend both hearings as well as the August 5th meeting so they could comment on the plan that's before you this evening. They were able to make suggestions and so forth and so on in reference to the mediation process? Absolutely. And, and Judge Case can confirm that as well, but they, yes, they were. Judge, I mean, I, I hear them speaking tonight. And that's why I asked that question. They were at the mediation. Were some of the concerns looked into and put into this mediation process? Judge Case? Yes. The uh, people that were notified who are re required to be notified, plus extras that uh, Ms. Johnson Velez's office uh, expanded the circle of friends, if you will, that were included in. Uh, they were invited to, and they participated in, some of them participated in the mediation, as well as the hearing, as well as the, the final uh, opportunity to speak about the settlement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from council members? All right. Hearing none. I, I actually, if I may, I, I wish to ask Ms. Johnson Velez, could you educate us just for purposes of, of tonight? I mean, we've gone through this, but if if we were to not proceed with this uh, mediated settlement agreement, um, what would be the, could you go through the damages uh, specifically that are being sought? How, how are they are quantified? Is it loss of use, loss of profit, uh, hourly attorney's fees? If, if you could go through that. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Harvey, who is uh, handling the litigation portion of this for our office to address that. Mr. Harvey, if you don't mind doing that, sir. Yes, Councilman. Um, so as you know, because this is a 1983 uh, action, there's... Oh. Mr. Shelby, you're muted. I'm muted? No, Mr. Shelby's muted. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm just asking if he can get closer to the microphone because I'm having trouble hearing him. Yeah, can so. you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. The damage they seek in the complaint would include 
uh, carrying costs to the property, lost opportunity costs, um, lost profits, uh, damages caused by the delay with what they assert as an unlawful denial of the application. And because it's an action day for the action, it, would, it does provide for attorney's fees in the event they were successful. And, and and if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, by success, so if they make any kind of recovery, they would be uh, entitled to proportionate uh, attorney's fees, hourly fees. Correct. Okay. Um, do we know what the rate, the the, the hourly rate is for, for uh, this type of work? Because I'm just an insurance defense lawyer. I, I don't do land use law. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I guess uh, Mr. McLaren, Mr. McLaren and Ms. Corbett are talking to their specific rates. I would imagine it'd be seven hundred dollars an hour. Okay, I got in the wrong uh, uh, area of law. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Carlson, yes, sir. Could I ask the same person, please? What happens if the city wins the the suit? If the city wins, obviously the plaintiffs would not recover anything and would not be entitled to fees. And do we collect damages in that case? Would we collect damages? No. Yes. Would they have to pay our attorney's fees? No. Anything else? Councilman Goods? I mean, Mr. Carlson brought up an excellent point. So if we lose, we pay their damages fees, but if we win, we don't collect any damage. Is that, that correct, Ms. Harvey? Well, again, they're the plaintiff in the lawsuit. So, you know, as a defendant, we would not recover anything. We're, we're not seeking to recover anything. We have no counterclaims or anything like that. Could, could I also get an attorney to explain to me, um, uh, somebody said this earlier, there, when there is an entitlement, the law says we have to protect the entitlement. And if we take it away, we need to compensate somebody. Um, but why is there a presumption that someone has the right to a new entitlement when they only have a certain entitlement right now? Why? Why is there a presumption that that is okay? Well, I, I believe what was said and when, what the law is that there, there, I mean, there's a presumption that the existing zoning is valid. Um, and there is case law that supports the notion that a, a landowner is not entitled to the highest and best use. Um, in this case, I mean, they're not seeking the, the highest use. Their, their density has been reduced um, several times over the course of this from the original ap application through the settlement agreement. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Thank you. Councilman, Councilman Miranda, did you have a Mr. question? Mr. Lance, when we first started, uh, you spoke about uh, certain things that happened. You, you did brief us on the 244 building in Clubhouse going down to 205 with three buildings, so forth and so on. But you also mentioned this uh, circuit court. So there is a case filed in circuit court, am I correct? That's correct. That is on and, hold. Uh, it's been stayed until these proceedings are concluded. I was going to say then that you, it was for dam, and you said it was for damages, and I forgot what else. Well, there there are two counts. One is a petition for writ of certiorari um, right. challenging the denial, the um, city council's decision to deny the original application last February, and then the second count is for damages under um, 42 U.S.C. section 1983. And then you asked for a uh, motion for a stay and the court granted you a motion for a stay. That's correct. The parties um, submitted a joint motion for a stay. I hate to put you in the hot seat and I'm not trying to, but I'm not asking you for your opinion on this case, but in cases something like this, have you all looked at the, in case the city was to lose, what the damages are? Comparative? Uh, I've done my own calculation there. I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm nothing. But I looked at if you have a 204 units at a thousand dollars, which is less than the going rate, that's 204,000 a month times 12 is 254,000 dollars a month. I mean a year. 2.448 million a year, plus attorney fees, plus costs, plus plus plus. So the city is facing something, in my opinion something in the upward of a couple of million minimum. That's what I think. And I'm not, I'm not a mediator. I'm not as smart as most of them. I'm not like Judge Case. I'm not like Judge Harvey. And, uh, but I've seen some of these cases that the city was in, and I'm not talking about a city far apart. And I'm not a lawyer. 
and I'm not, I shouldn't say these things, but I'm looking at them now on facts. And I, I read everything that I wrote down, most what everyone said, and they're good. Certainly they have the, the ability to say the facts and, and their part, and they agreed. However, how do you apply everything they said to the law? That's where I don't know. And that's why I need some help. Well, certainly, and, 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 and um, David might want to comment on this further, but certainly the city um, is currently um, subject to unknown exposure for a unknown amount of damages. As I said, um, the amount of damages that they might claim have not been quantified yet. And so there is the risk of exposure that would remain open um, were the city not to accept the settlement this evening. I don't know, David, if you wanted to add anything um, to that. Yeah, I would agree with Councilman Miranda that in the event the city did not prevail, then the damages could be significant. This is not a tort action, so there is no cap. So the damages would include, again, if the plaintiff were successful, would include the attorney's fees and all these opportunity costs, um, which yes, to be very significant. In your opinion, it would be what I'm missing, I'm sorry. I said it would be very significant. I, I, I have not done any sort of analysis. No, I understand, I understand. No, I understand. You don't want to add no more fuel to the fire. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Dinkfelder. This, this, this um, monetary discussion concerns me greatly. Uh, frankly, <clears throat> I think it's the kind of discussion that all council members should have offline <clears throat> with Ms. Johnson Velez, but I don't think it's the kind of discussion we should be having online like this uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I, I will say that and, I, and I'm not saying how I'm going to vote on this particular case. I haven't decided yet. As Mr. Shelby has told us, we we should wait and, until we hear all the information. But I will say that what concerns me about this monetary discussion is that it encourages any developer who comes along and gets their project turned down by city council to just turn around hire Mr. McLaren, file the lawsuit, okay, crank up the lawsuit, threaten us with all sorts of damages, 1983, attorney's fees and everything else, and we fold and and yada, yada. And the, and I, the concern I have is not only is it bad form for this council, but look at the message that it sends to the community that, that this this rezoning you know the, this rezoning process can, can be viewed potentially as a farce okay now i'm not saying that in reference to this particular case and like i said i haven't decided how i'm going to go on it but i think that it's a slippery slope right when we when we just say well we you know we, we're scared of getting sued we're scared of getting sued. that's life in the, in in this world okay you can always get sued. You have to evaluate it on a case by case basis in terms of, you know, how you, how you move forward. So I urge council to look at the settlement agreement, see if it's a fair deal in light of in light of the evidence and not worry about not look over our shoulder in terms of being sued and the amount of damages and this and that. We have to do what's right for the community. Okay? And I'm not necessarily saying what is right for the community on this and each each one of these is a case by case basis based upon the evidence that's in front of us but if if we if we get preoccupied with lawsuits and and money and that sort of thing then we might as well not even waste our time 5 hours later into this evening uh doing this we might as well just rubber stamp these things and we could do it in a half hour chilling. it's a chilling effect and that's all there is to it um, so let's not let's not allow ourselves to to succumb to that chilling effect, and let's just base these cases and our decision on the evidence that's in front of us, one way or the other. Thank you very much, Councilman Miranda. I take um, I take thought that I guess no council member ever thought of losing and paying something. Am I correct? Never crossed anybody's mind. I always speak the facts that I see before me. And I think I'm entitled to do that. Like I did earlier when I thought about lot splitting. I said that also. 
I say what I believe in and I'll hold facts and I'll take anybody on, on any time, on anything that I've ever said and prove it. I can prove what it's cost this city on Bay Shore and Bay to Bay years back. I can prove everything I'm saying. I'm not saying that you don't, you, you only fight when you have a real chance of winning. And I, I didn't say I was going to vote against the support. So I can say this, you look at the facts and then you decide, is it fine for the whole city of Tampa? Not just for the, the community that, that's hurting. And I'm not saying it's beneficial to them, but you have to look at a reason, be reasonable, whether you do something, whether it's a penny, a dollar or a million dollars. Because I'd rather have a penny a day and double it than give you a million dollars, any one of you. Because I come out on top with a penny a day and doubling for 30 days. So I'm saying what I know. I'm saying what I've suffered for the city. I'm saying what the city has suffered on mistakes in the past. So I think I know what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. And, and I wanted to um, address that issue. Councilman Dinfelder brings up, I think, a, a worthy point, which is um, we don't want to, in every single land use um, mediated settlement agreement, et cetera, that we have, be afraid of the specter of attorney's fees. Um, that, that's not the way a city should function. We're here to protect the people, but to protect the people under the rules that we have. And the reason I brought that up is because we have reports from the city of Tampa, from the planning commission, uh, which find that this is uh, consistent with the code, consistent with the, the what the city of Tampa is looking for, et cetera. And I just think it's something, given that, uh, that we should consider. Given that, that we can cons consider. I don't think I brought this up to this level in any other hearing in the past. I, I just think that we should consider all of our options. What happens if we go down this route? What happens if we go down this route and, and, and what, and what's going to happen to us prospectively? I just think, but, but for, for future uh, uh, hearings, again, uh, the, the, the issue of a chilling effect, I think is well taken, but I think that the, the point of distinguishment on this issue is that we have the, the findings that we have um, from city staff. And so therefore we should just proceed uh, uh, knowing what could happen. Because uh, it could be very, very bad. We're talking about a signal. I'm, I'm not going to guess uh, in terms of how much money it is, but you know what? It's certainly going to be a lot. And you know, this morning we were we were talking about capping a, a CRA uh, in order to spend some money for the city. Well, we could cap the CRA and and use that money for attorneys fees if this doesn't go our way. I say that as a joke, obviously. But I in other that. words, <laughs> we need to we need to just be aware of the of the reasonable consequences when there is such viable risk before us. That's all I'm saying. All right, thank you very much. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I think conversely, um, we also need to uh, maybe set a precedent um, just because there's one that we lost in the past doesn't mean that we couldn't, if well prepared, win one. And then that would serve as a baseline to explain that if a potential entitlement is not an entitlement. All right. Anybody else? Hearing none, Ms. Corbett, you have uh, your rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Cami Corbett, for the record. And uh, could I share my screen, please? Sure, go and ahead. And I'd like to have David Hay from the Planning Commission brought up, brought into the room. He's about there. There he is. He is here. So out of this. Mr. Hay, in your professional planning opinion, as the designated Hillsborough County, uh, Hillsborough Planning Commission liaison for the city of Tampa, is the approval of residential density on this site inconsistent with coastal management objective 1.1, which I've displayed on my screen? Excuse me, Mr. This, uh, yes, Mr. Shelby. Forgive me for interrupting, but I want to make sure our the council members present. Because yes. Do I see Dingfelder? I don't, I don't see Dingfelder. Okay, I just want to be clear, council members, again, if you are oh, there, he is. Thank you. If you can just remain on video just so we don't run into that issue. If you plan on obviously um, staying for the hearing. 
Okay, and if you and if you are going to depart, please announce that so it's clear for the record. Thank you. All right, Ms. Corbin, I'm going to start you now. Okay, thank you. I, again, Mr. Hay, in your professional planning opinion, as the designated Tampa Hillsborough Planning Commission liaison for the city of Tampa, is the approval of residential density on this site inconsistent with the coastal management objective 1.1 or is it consistent with it? In a, it's consistent with that policy, residential. Thank you. Uh, is the applicant in this case required to analyze impacts to hurricane evacuation? Uh, no, that is typically done at a plan amendment stage. Right, and consistent with uh, CM policy 1.2.5, correct? Correct. That that's when you would look at hurricane evacuation at any uh, plan amendment stage. And also, I guess back on that slide, if we were in a plan amendment and uh, hurricane evacuation times had to be mitigated, is the voluntary site plan and the transit improvements that the applicant offered consistent with the types of things that are uh, normally considered to uh, mitigate for hurricane evacuation times? Uh, they can be, um, They, yes, they can be uh, just like uh, uh, some other uh, things that could be offered. Right, as listed in the policy. Yes. Is the applicant required to mitigate for hurricane shelter space? Yes, at a rezoning stage, they need to do it at permitting. Right, they need to do it at permitting, okay. And with respect to traffic, uh, what does the comprehensive plan require an applicant to do to mitigate impacts for transportation? And I think I have the relevant policies highlighted for you on my screen. Well, they would, we, we would look at, again, uh, this, uh, let me read the objective because. <clears throat> well, let me, let me back up. Is the, is this site located in a transportation concurrency exception area? Yes, south of Fletcher, everything is, uh, ex the, you're in a transportation concurrency exception area. Right, and so our mitigation is, is traffic mitigated through the contribution of mitigation payments, transportation mitigation payment? Uh, no. No, are they, is that what's required? Right, it, with it being in an exception area, um, you wouldn't need to meet that. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, in your opinion, is the proposed revised site plan consistent with the comprehensive plan and is the multifamily use compatible with single family homes in the area? It's consistent and compatible. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one last policy uh, question you had referred to earlier in response to a councilman's question, the industrial plan policies for the industrial land use category. Does that category, does that category also contain policies that prohibit residential uses to be located in close proximity to it? Well, industrial does not allow residential as a use, um, as one of the allowed uses. Okay. It's that's Thank your question. You. Yes, that's my question. Just want to touch on briefly, uh, very briefly, school concurrency. There were some comments in the written comments submitted to the record. Uh, just wanted to show you that 205 dwelling units would generate 24 uh, elementary, nine middle school, and 11 high school students. And then also uh, with reference to capacity, this is the five-year work plan for the school board. And you'll see in year four, there's a new PK-8 on Manhattan uh, that will likely provide capacity in the future. Um, and if, uh, the, if it so happens that this application gets ahead of this new school year, uh, they will be required to pay mitigation to help it fund that school improvement. Again, speaking to traffic, we have the trip generation in blue on what's existing today and then what's proposed. Uh, we have on the left, you have the prior uh, traffic impacts in the AM and PM peak hour, and on the right, you see the reduction there. And again, we are a significant uh, reduction from what's already allowed by right on the site today. This is a map that, dem that shows that sort of south of Gandhi area, it's zoomed out from the map that was shown with the staff report. 
you can see the sites that are uh, in red, outlined in red, are multifamily densities, 22 units to the acre, 24, 16, 17, and 22. And they are adjacent to the blue areas, which are single family homes. And they're in the same proximity as this particular site. And you can also see that the uh, trash site has on the Western boundary has, and Northern boundary has green space. So there is existing uh, single family and multifamily in close proximity to one another in this particular area. Uh, I put this slide up not to call anyone out or to embarrass anyone. I respect Ms. Pointer and her advocacy, but I did want to make sure that council's aware that when this, when social media posts were posted about this meeting, there were posted that there would be 240 units and there would be building heights of 60 feet. Uh, most of the public comment that came in uh, in the written record was made uh, was after this post. Um, and 84% followed the post. And there was no mention to the revisions to the site plan or to the fact that this was not the same as the request before to the RM24 where there was no site plan control in place. I think that's important just for relevance of the data. A lot of the late testimony you heard was lay testimony generally in favor to development. We don't want it, uh, but multifamily is permitted by the existing regulations. Approval will make existing problems worse, but substantial competent evidence shows a reduction to traffic and flooding. Can you hear me? Because I'm hearing an echo. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, because the FAR is, uh, it, the allowable FAR is 1.5, and then school concurrency is analyzed at site development. Um, there's a lot of speculation to about the ability to evacuate in a hurricane. Uh, the regulations do not require evacuation or mitigation. Uh, mitigation is being provided voluntarily. And yes, I understand the residents are frustrated and they feel that this is being done to them. But unfortunately, the regulation, or fortunately or unfortunately, the regulations that exist today are those that are applicable to this application and to the settlement agreement. You have an upcoming workshop on October 22nd, uh, 2020, to discuss changes to the regulations. And that is your opportunity to show them what you're able to do and willing to do that this council is willing to do to help them address their problems. Um, may I ask how I'm doing on time? You're at seven minutes and 31 seconds. More, five minutes plus the minute I gave the other speaker plus another 20 seconds I gave another speaker. So how much time? No, um, just, I would like to ask, uh, have Scott McLaren address uh, briefly, the issue of presumptive, uh, the existing designation being presumptively uh, valid. Uh, good evening, uh, Council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you uh, very much. You know, the issue really here is do we meet the criteria, right? And um, there was an indication made from Council for the City that the um, existing zoning is presumptively valid and, and that is true when the hearing starts uh, but as held by the supreme court of florida in both the snyder and gbv cases um, once the applicant um, meets its initial burden of showing compliance with the rezoning criteria that that burden disappears the presumption of, of validity disappears the burden shifts then to the city and the city must show through competent substantial evidence um, that the rezoning application quote does not meet the published criteria that's a direct quote from the gbv case so in this case what has happened we have uh, presented evidence uh, from the city staff from the planning commission staff and through our experts that we meet the criteria um, there is no uh, uh, expert testimony to the contrary and as Catherine's Bay uh, which is on your screen indicates that is what is required on these issues of compatibility flooding um, and these other issues you must have expert opinions on it and so there um, we believe very respectfully uh, that we do meet uh, we have met our initial burden and there has not been competent substantial evidence uh, sufficient to show that we do not meet, quote, the published criteria 
end quote, as set forth by the Supreme Court in the GBV case. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to stop the clock. Thank you. All right. Council member, uh, any questions or comments, or may I get a motion to close this public hearing? Uh, Ms. Johnson Velez. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, uh, Senior Assistant City Attorney. I just wanted to clarify one thing that Mr. McLaren said. So the, the standard that he mentioned is applicable in just a regular rezoning case. However, if you recall, when I started my presentation, this, this case is before you on the recommendation of a special magistrate regarding a settlement proposal. And so your initial decision tonight is whether what action you want to take on that settlement proposal. If you decide to accept the settlement, then you would implement the settlement um, approval by adopting an ordinance or first reading of an ordinance rezoning the property. All righty. Mr. Vieira, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And two questions. Um, I guess one is to uh, our attorney, Marty. Um, I, I believe, j just so that we know on, on these, uh, that the first hearing went down five to two. I think it was five to two. I, I think myself and Councilman or Chairman Maniscalco voting against the denial. Are How, how are we, uh, just for purposes of, of knowing, how are we all uh, uh, married to that uh, prior vote, I, I guess, if you will. Do we need to show anything for any change of opinion, just for our own edification? Well, uh, I'd like um, Ms. Johnson Velez to follow up after I make my comments, just to have her add to it or, or uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But the way it appears, Council, is you have a new site plan in front of you, you have a mediated settlement in front of you. You've had a new hearing tonight with a full presentation. So it would be my opinion that that what you have before you is the competent substantial evidence upon which to base your decision is in tonight's record. Um, and the circumstances have changed from the previous hearing. Um, and certainly you have the benefit of a, a mediated settlement. So the question that I have, or I guess to answer your statement more directly, uh, would be that your decision ultimately must be supported by the record. And if you're in a position to articulate the basis for your decision tonight with regard to whether to accept, reject, or modify the magistrate's uh, recommendation, um, then your previous decisions were based on um, facts that are perhaps not before you tonight. Would that be a correct assumption, Ms. johnson Velez? Uh, yes, Susan johnson Velez, um, legal department. Yes, I, I would agree with that. But you do have a different uh, development proposal before you this evening. Um, you have had um, evidence presented um, uh, for that um, site plan. And so you must consider the site plan that's before you this evening. So then to answer and to follow up and to answer your question more directly, you are not bound to your previous vote um, because that is not the, the um, uh, before you tonight. So my, my, my suggestion to you as it always is, is your case, um, the city's case, the city of Tampa's case in any decision that you make in a quasi is only as good as the record that you create or you elicit or that is presented to you and that's what you have before you tonight thank you and, and qu quick question too if i if i may mr chair um if i may mr chair um and additionally tonight and i and i don't do this to open up a can of worms just in case who knows where this is going to go um this is a mediated settlement agreement in other words if and i'm just you know, if, if I'm just going to put up a hypothetical, uh, let's say that this was a project with 50 apartments and we said, you know what, would you take 48? Again, just putting something out there. Can, can further negotiation occur tonight? Well, uh, Susan Johnson Velez, uh, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Um, Councilman Vieira, yes, if you recall, I, I need to give you your three options. You may either mm -hmm. accept uh, the recommendation, you may reject the recommendation, 
or you may modify it. If you um, seek modifications, then the applicant uh, must agree to those modifications. And then if, if the applicant does agree to those, then you may proceed to implement them through um, first reading of, of the ordinance. Of an ordinance. Thank you. Well, uh, and Mr. Thank Chairman, you, Mr. I, have, I, I have a question. I have a question, if I can, just to clarify the record, just for perhaps Mr. Harvey um, handling the litigation. Um, if the council should um, choose for whatever reason, which they'd have to articulate clearly, but what what is the role of the record of the previous hearings should this litigation go forward? Hmm. Not clear what, you're what I'm asking to you is if this case returns to a litigation posture, for whatever reason, then what would what what the city would rely on would be the record at the previous hearings. Oh, um, I think that takes into I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can discuss at this forum. Sorry, so, sorry. Okay. I can answer that. The the petition for writ of cert that's part of the pending lawsuit is a challenge or, or seeks to quash the decision from the February 13th, 2020 hearing. Okay. Okay. I apologize if I'm out of line on that question, but I'm glad you were able to clarify the record for the council members. Councilman Dingfeld and then Councilman Goods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, just as a matter of, of protocol, I wanted to, if nobody has yet, I wanted to thank uh, Judge Rice, I mean Judge Case, uh, for um, for the participating in our mediation and and hanging in there with us this evening. So, um, uh, Your Honor, uh, I never had the privilege to appear in front of you in the Sixth Circuit, but uh, but we appreciate your efforts uh, this evening. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. Councilman Goods. I want to get back on track a little bit because I said I got multiple different roles here. Our perspective of this is that we're at mediation point for us to make a decision. So everything in the past is gone now. Yeah. Is that correct, Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson Velez? Well, you have a new site plan and a new uh, development proposal before you this evening. And so, um, the, the prior proposal, it wouldn't be appropriate for you to, you know, base your decision on what was presented in February because we do have a new proposal um, that resulted from the mediation proceedings before you this evening. And so that is what count is before council for consideration this evening. That's what I thought. So we, we, we need to proceed and, and move on. All right. And I, I did have one other, one other question just for clarification from what Mr. Shelby said and what Ms. Johnson Belez said. Hmm. Um, because it, it triggered something in my mind. Ms. Corbett did uh, uh, an interesting job of, of cross-examining uh, Mr. Hay about his opinions this evening um, having to do with the comp plan and that sort of thing. One of the attorneys, whoever wants to answer this question, Mr. Harvey or whatever, is what she elicited tonight admissible in either the petition for writ of cert case or the 1983 case? Well, again, I, I will take a stab at that. Um, Councilman Dinkfelder, Susan Johnson Velez, uh, senior. Well, the, reason I, the reason I ask is I thought we're participating in a mediation process right now. And, and traditionally, whatever happens during mediation is not admissible if you, your mediation fails. <clears throat> Mr. Vieira will confirm that as a regular matter. So confirmed. <laughs> and, and, and you're correct. Um, pursue, under the statute, um, these proceedings are part of the um, 7051 proceedings um, and council does that because especially council has the ability to modify the settlement proposal further and um, any statements or actions of, for the city or for, or for the applicant are evidence of an offer to compromise and therefore inadmissible in any proceeding. And so um, I can, that is part of the statutory process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to close? <laughs> so moved. 
We have a motion to from Dingfeld with a second from Councilman Goods. Is there any objection to closing this hearing? Hearing none by unanimous consent without any objection. The hearing is closed. Uh, wait a second. Wait a second. I believe the petitioner wants to add something. Ms. Corbett, are you asking to be recognized? Uh, yes, I am asking to be recognized. Uh, is okay. this. May I have a motion to re reopen this hearing? So moved. Second. We have a motion to reopen the public hearing by uh, Councilman Vieira, second from Councilman Citro. Any objection? Hearing none. By unanimous consent, this public hearing is now reopened. Ms. Corbett. Yes, we wanted to have Mr. McLaren re uh, respond to some of the questions and answers the City Council was giving in the discussion that was going on about what the proceedings this evening, just briefly. I, I just, uh, you know, make sure that there's no misunderstanding that we're necessarily acquiescing the uh, to the admissibility of the evidence tonight, uh, should the uh, should the rezoning be approved or denied? Um, I think that this is a uh, it's it's a unique uh, it's a unique um, proceeding. It is in part legislative, meaning that um, part of this is your decision on the on the legislative matter, and that is whether or not to accept the settlement. However. For, on the rezoning uh, portion, it is a quasi-judicial uh, proceeding. And so uh, just any quasi-judicial proceeding, your decision, it is our position, must be based upon competent substantial evidence in the record. And then the evidence in this record would be, uh, we believe, admissible. But I, I you know, I don't I don't want to argue. I just didn't want there to be any you know, suggestion that we agreed or, or anything like that. So thank you for your time. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Thanks. Thank you I very knew, much. I knew you couldn't stand silent on that one, Mr. McLaren. Yes, Councilman Vieira. Yes. That's and, good lawyering. And, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, you know, whether or not it's admissible, I think one thing is clear that uh, the, the testimony by Mr. Hay, uh, whether it's binding and going to be out for publication today, um, it, it will be forthcoming. And I, I, I just wouldn't see any reason uh, uh, logically for him to change his opinions. Um, you know, maybe I'm wrong. But in other words, that's the testimony that will be presented. I, I, at, the, at the very least, I think we should stipulate to that, in my opinion, just putting that out there. Thank you very much. May I have a motion? to close the public hearing. <laughs> Vera, Big yes. Felder. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira with a second from Councilman Dinkfelder. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none by unanimous consent, the hearing is now closed. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Shelby. I, again, with the hearing closed, um, you have a threshold question that does not appear on your agenda. As um, Ms. Johnson Velez articulated, you have a motion due on the special magistrate's recommendation. You can ask her to repeat that if you like, but I believe it's to either accept, reject, or modify that recommendation. That is your threshold question um, uh, before you uh, uh, would get to um, uh, the, the second step, uh, depending on council's decision. What is the pleasure of council? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Since I, I believe I made the motion originally last year that um, started all this, so everybody can blame me for this late hour. Hmm. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to move to approve the special magistrate's recommendation um, with great hesitancy. Um, and it's not based upon the threat of litigation. I'm not afraid of litigation. Um, but it is, it is based upon actually a very excellent comment by Councilman Vieira about 10 seconds ago. Um, because I appreciate Mr. Hay. Mr. Hay is a, a fine professional. He does his job. But the testimony that he gave would be absolutely damning 
to us in trying to defend ourselves on the basis of coastal high hazard. Um, the, uh, my original motion last year was based in, in great part on the coastal high hazard concerns. And I still have tremendous coastal high hazard concerns about building these units, too many units south of Gandhi, evacuating these additional people, everybody getting in the way of each other, trying to get out of the peninsula. It's been a problem for decades and we're only making it worse. However, law is the law. And unfortunately, our coastal high hazard language in the comp plan right now, it's inadequate. And Ms. Corbett, and as hesitant as I am to say, Mr. McLaren have both shown that inadequacy in our language. It's not anybody's fault. That language has been there a long time, but it's inadequate. So with that, with great hesitancy and with great uh, apologies to the community uh, and to the five <laughs> folks who stayed up so late to give us their opinion and participated in all this, uh, I will move to, um, to accept the special magistrate's re recommendation. I believe we've made some progress since last year. We've reduced the number of total units. We've um, uh, reduced the height of, the build of several of the buildings. Uh, they've made some con concessions in regard to uh, contributions in regard to bus shelters, et cetera. So it hasn't been for naught. Uh, we've made some progress as we have in some of the other uh, cases that we've been involved in and litigated. But at the end of the day, we have to strengthen the coastal high ha hazard provisions in the comp plan. And we will do that over the course of the next six months, six to nine months. So. That's uh, that's my motion. We have a second from Councilman Dinkfelder with a second from Councilmember Vieira to accept the settlement agreement. Roll call vote, please. And before, if I may, Mr. Stop Chair, back. just yes, sir. and just explain my vote, if I may, because I seconded that uh, just very briefly. Um, you know, I, I share Councilman Dinkfelder's sentiments, which is that this is done with great hesitancy. My first vote was done with great hesitancy because when I look at this objectively outside of legal, uh, the, the, the legal lens, uh, the procedural lens that we have right now, I don't like what I see. When I hear our friends uh, south of Gandhi speaking here tonight, I agree with them on the substance. Uh, the big challenge is that we're dealing with rules that are applied, that were applied when whoever the property owner was uh, purchased this land. And, um, and, and when they purchased this land, there were certain rules that were in effect that they reasonably relied upon. And now, and, and they have a check. And tonight, in a sense, they, they come to city council to cash that check. And we can't go, in my opinion, no, you can't cash it. Uh, because there were certain rules uh, that were under there for them. The way I see this is competent substantial evidence is the language that the court understands. That is, let's say, Spanish. And if we go into that court speaking anything other than the language of competent substantial evidence, if we go in there speaking English, they're not going to understand it. It's not going to, it's not going to move the court. We've got to speak that language. And, and I think that tonight, that's the only language that we've heard um, uh, that we should hear, I guess, tonight, I guess, if you will, whenever it comes to our decision. However, however, again, if is like, like I joked before, don't hate the player, hate the game, right? And we can change the game. And, and I think that's the larger point that has got to be made with regards to this. So I vote for this with great hesitation. Um, but, um, but I, but I nevertheless do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah. Roll call vote, please. Boots? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Ding Felder? Yes. Citro? Yes. Ryan Scacco? Yes. Carlson? No. And Vieira? Yes. Motion carry with Carlson voting no. Now, do we read the ordinance? Is that correct or does that settle that? Yes, read so now you read that it, this is now a motion uh, for first reading to move that ordinance. May, who would like to read this ordinance um, for item number 11? Councilman Dingfelder, you uh, made the prior motion. Would you like to take on the ordinance as well or no? No, I'll, I'll pass. I've done my part. 
Okay, Councilman Citro, would you like to take the ordinance? And if you can, Mr. Chairman, I just want to confirm with staff, I believe there's a revision sheet that's attached to that. Ms. Corbett, is that correct? Revisions between first and second reading? I see her nodding yes. So if you could make the revision sheet as part of your motion, along with the usual language that, that you do. Okay. With great hesitation, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm not going to thank you for this one, but I will read the ordinance. An ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance rezoning the property in the general vicinity of 6603 South Trash Street. In the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification, IG, industrial general to PD, plan development, residential, multifamily providing an effective date. This is file number REZ 1994 with the revision sheet. That's I'll second it. Do we have a second? We have a second. I'm, not, I'm not done, Mr. Chair, but go ahead, Marty. You want to say something? I don't know. I was going to let, uh, just ask you to be continue to be recognized to finish. Go ahead. Thank you Councilor. very much. Is that the uh, petitioner has met uh, the burden of proof. Uh, the request of waivers will not substantially interfere with any injury or rights or others. Uh, property that would be affected by the waivers. Proposed development as shown in the site plan promotes or encourages development that is an that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, second, Vera. We have a second from Councilmember Vieira. Roll call vote. Good. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Dean Felder. Yes. Petro. Yes. Maniscaco. Yes. Carlson. No. And Vieira. Yes. Motion carried with Carlson voting no. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. We now go to information reports and new business by council members. I'll start at the end of the day as Councilman Vieira. Uh, thank you, sir. I do have a motion. I'm trying to find here my phone. I motion for staff from revenue and finance to bring forward a resolution and now allowing my office to donate $500 to Forest Hills United to help fund a neighborhood Christmas parade and fundraiser in Forest Hills taking place on December 5th, 2020. And that said resolution be brought before council at the November 5th, 2020 meeting for approval. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira. Do we have a second? second. Councilman Goods with the second. Uh, is there any objection? Mm. Hearing none by unanimous consent, the motion passes. Anything else, sir? Uh, you know what? I, I, I do. I have to look for something, if I may. May sure. I come back? Thank Councilman, you. Councilman Goods, do you have anything for new business, sir? Yes, sir. Real quickly, briefly. Uh, gentlemen, you might have saw an article in uh, the paper or news young lady who uh, saw uh, a need for our city that we were not doing was for consumption consumption sites i'd like to make a, rec a motion to give miss vivian anderson a combination for helping move the city forward for, uh, for all inclusiveness of, of on sign language Ms. vivian knows that there were signs at a construction site indicating men working and women were also working Vivian did not like how the signing excluded women we even had the fortitude to reach out to the mayor Castro's office and request men working side be changed to workers present. I'd like to make the make the this presentation, this accommodation to her virtually at her school. Uh, we're waiting for, the, for waiting for the school to give us a date to do that. Second. second. We have a second. A motion from Councilman Good. Second from Councilman Citro. Any objection? No, no I just. Can I just say I I interviewed this this um, uh, young lady with her mom the other day on Catholic on Tampa and she's amazing she's really impressive and she's going to be very impressive when she grows up I'm sure. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No, we have a motion from Councilman Guz. I believe the second from Councilman Citro. Any objections to the motion? Hearing no objection by unanimous consent, 
the motion uh, and no objection, the motion passes. Anything else, sir? Anything else, Councilman Goods? That's it, sir. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, if I may. Sure, go ahead, sir. Uh, th thank you very much. I wish to do a commendation for, Ra for Randy Zumerand. It's Z-O-M-E-R-M-A-A-N-D for his years of service to Big Brothers and Big Sisters. But to thank be presented you. at a later time. Do we have a second? Thank you. From Councilman Miranda. Any objection to the motion? Hearing none, with no objection, unanimous consent, the motion passes. Anything else, and, Councilman? And Goods? then if I may, this, I know last, you know, um, our firefighters and police officers every year do their, their run. Uh, last week was the virtual run of, of the police officer, or the uh, uh, 754 Firefighters 5K. And um, I did that, but didn't turn out well because I'm out of shape. Uh, but this Saturday, or yeah, this Saturday is also now the police memorial run. So I just encourage everybody to take part in that. But I wanted to give a special commendation to a young man um, who, who's actually organizing a, a, a part of a memorial run by the name of Chris Hill, who is the, the son of the late detective Randy Bell, uh, who was a fallen Tampa police officer, um, if I may, for his work with the, um, uh, with the uh, uh, memorial run. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira with a second from Councilman Citro. Any objection to the motion? Hearing none by unanimous consent, the motion passes with no objection. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dingfelder, do you have anything for new business, sir? I, I do, but the first thing I wanted to ask about was this virt virtual run. I, I've been virtually running uh, most of my adult life, which in my, my world means I don't run. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway, um, my only motion to council is uh, in regard to the October 22nd uh, planning, uh, planners and planning workshop, um, I'd like to make sure that staff includes three, uh, three, three of, uh, important items, um, one of which we were just talking about, which is um, uh, changing the comp plan as it relates to the coastal high hazard uh, area. Uh, the second one, and this is all consolidated into one motion. The second one uh, is what I spoke to last week is um, including uh, the front porch ordinance um, amendments to it so that so the front porch ordinance can apply all across the city. As Mr. Miranda says, we should apply things across the city, not just in certain places. And then, uh, and then my proposed uh, changes to uh, Chapter Twenty Seven One Fifty One, uh, which I will I will get get you guys a copy of, but I just want to make sure that staff is prepared and and uh, uh, part um, includes discussion of all three of those items at our Ten Twenty Two workshop. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Martin Shelby. I uh, just wanted to follow up on that, Councilman Dingfelder. I did see the council's calendar that just came out this afternoon right before the meeting started, and I noticed on the 22nd, it did in fact have a workshop to include discussion of the front porch ordinance amendment. Council addresses chapter 27151 code of ordinance. I don't believe there is anything with regard to the coastal high hazard area. All right. Um, we'll start, we'll start. I believe it's on the calendar and uh, the clerk can, can verify this, that means it went out um, under the motion practice. It went out to the different departments. Is that correct? It, it, that it is correct. On the calendar. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. So, so it sounds like they got the message and, the, and they're already going to do that on the 22nd, Marty? Or two of them, but not the coastal high hazard comp plan. I don't see that on there. Um, does anybody from staff know anything about that or uh, the clerk's office? I don't see a specific discussion about that. Probably not there. Ms. Grimes and I have discussed it, but I don't think it's gotten anywhere else. So, I'll, all right, I'll revise my, thank you, Marty, for that. I'll revise my motion just specifically to ask staff to include the uh, top plan coastal high hazard uh, area uh, issues and possible changes and add that to the 1022 workshop. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Dingfelder with a second from Councilman Carlson. Any objection to the motion? Hearing none with no objection by unanimous consent, the motion passes. Anything else, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Yes, 
Now, for Vieira's first motion, he made that motion last uh, last meeting on October first. Sorry, I'm. I uh, it's it's uh, it's working from home. I'm forgetting things. So so I hereby do I hereby withdraw that if I may. Do I need to make a motion? And thank you for that. I didn't know if I made it or not. <laughs> uh, do you want to withdraw the motion? I hereby kindly withdraw it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank if, you. If there's any objection, counsel, you can do it by unanimous consent to accept that. Mm -hmm. Any objection, my friends? No, by unanimous consent without objection, the motion by Council Member Vieira has been withdrawn. Thank you. Council Member Carlson. Thank you. No motions. I just wanted to thank um, Randy Goers and Carol Post for their um, leadership on the uh, Neighborhood Commercial District uh, program. You all remember a, a little over a year ago, I think we passed a motion to ask um, the Planning Commission to look into creating neighborhood commercial districts. There are potentially 130 of them throughout the city, and it's the integration of how, how people interact with neighborhoods and the businesses there. And uh, the, so the first two studies are going forward. One is in Main Street in West Tampa, and the other one is in the Palmasia area. I think Mr. Dingfelder maybe sat in the other day too, although we weren't allowed to talk to each other. But I would encourage you all to um, sit in these and, and listen to them. The city is taking planning in house now, and they listen to our ideas and they're, they're thanking us in the meetings, but um, it's, it's, it's great planning. It's, it's great uh, 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 public input gathering. And I think they're going to um, come up with some some incredible ideas at the end of this. And and once we get done with these two, hopefully we'll do the other 128. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else, sir? Councilman? No. Uh, nothing tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Councilman Miranda, do you have anything, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. May I have a motion to receive and follow up? Oh, Mr. Oh, Chairman. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask uh, Council that to make a motion to receive and file the conflict forms for Councilman Goods and Councilman Dingfelder for cases that were heard on September 24th evening agenda, which have been provided and the clerk has in her possession. So if a motion to receive and file that as well. Second. We have a motion to receive and file uh, those documents and all documents by Councilman Miranda with the second Councilman Vieira. Any objection? All right, hearing none without any objection, passes unanimously. I could put that into one motion to receive and follow everything, correct, Mr. Shelby, including those I, conflict forms with everything else? Would that be acceptable to the clerk or do you want it more specific? I mean, you could list them as part of that motion. It's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, the motion passes by unanimous consent with any objection. We are adjourned. Good night. Good meeting. We need to receive them.